Right folks, this has been a rather long awaited video, <laughs> so I'm really sorry. Um, at the end of the coasts module, we tackle some exam questions. And because we are currently in lockdown, we um, haven't been able to do that properly. You've had some individual feedback on them, but um, we haven't had what we would normally do in class, what we go through and we share ideas and all of that. I'm gonna do my best to recreate that. Um, it won't be quite the same, but uh, nevertheless. So these are exam questions right at the back of the Coasts module booklet. I have um, taken some, uh, <laughs> as you can say, um, cropped images from a scanned version of the module booklet, the quality of which is terrible. So if you can dig out your um, module booklet, you will find that a lot easier. But they are sort of on screen, um, if that's helpful to you. Okay, let's just talk about exam technique generally before we start. So you really do need to pause before you answer an exam question, you need to consider the uh, three things on the screen. You have to find your command word. That's not just in geography, that's in all of your subjects. You have to find your command word because if you are being commanded to do something, i.e. describe, explain, evaluate, you have to do that. And if you follow a different command, one that you've made up in your head, you will not do well. So you have to find the command word and you have to do what it says. We did this back in induction in geography. So if you dig out your induction booklet, you should find you have a list of all the command words and what they mean. But equally, you can Google them. They, they're all over the internet as well. So you've got to find it and you've got to make sure you know what it means. Sometimes questions will have trip hazards. Um, this is not a technical term, it's just what I call them. It's things that if you don't read the question carefully, you could uh, get them wrong. So it's like, is it singular? Is it plural? Do you have to refer to figure one? Or can you use your own knowledge? I'll try and identify those as we go through. And in geography, it's really important to look at the number of marks. Partly because the number of marks should give you a clue about how long you should spend on it. It is very roughly a minute a mark, very roughly. But also in geography, it's to do with um, how you approach the question. So our short questions, you just get on with it. No, you know, hanging around. But longer questions, they need an introduction, a main body, a conclusion. They need case studies. It's a very different approach. Okay, so always before you answer a question, find your command word, identify trip hazards and look for the number of marks. Okay, the first questions are to do with a map. And luckily the map has shown up quite nicely. <laughs> but let's do what we said, right. So our command is suggest, which means you don't actually necessarily know the answer. You need to put your geographical brain in gear and think what could be sensible. Okay, suggest. Trip hazards, we've got to only look at boxes A and B, and we've got to consider cost-benefit analysis. It's five marks, so we're just going to crack on with it. Okay, box A. I can see quite a lot of stuff in box A. I can see um, a village called Wells next to the sea. I can see a school and some churches. I can see a miniature railway, I can see a lifeboat station, I can see roads. If I'm thinking cost-benefit analysis, what I'm thinking here is there's quite a lot of stuff that needs protecting. If I look in box B, hmm, not so much, is there? So remember the trip hazards, box A, box B, cost-benefit analysis. What they're trying to get you to realise is here it is worth spending money to protect here, it isn't really. That's what they're trying to get you to talk about. The way to bump yourself up through the marks is to um, use specific map evidence to talk about what there is worth protecting here and you know the fact that there's not very much in box B. And you could also suggest, uh, remember that's our command, suggest 
Uh, one of the four options, we've got hold the line, advance the line, manage retreat, do nothing. So you could equally choose one of those four options for each box and that would be a really good answer. Okay. Question two, or 1A part two. With reference to figure one, but thinking of changes that could affect coastlines globally. So we've got two jobs there. We need to look at figure one, but also to think bigger. Suggest, again, why there is likely to be an increasing need for shoreline management. Okay, so let's think of something that's affecting coastlines globally. Ooh, guess what? Sea levels are rising, aren't they? Because of climate change. Sea level rise is gonna affect all coastlines globally but we also need to link that specifically to figure one. Six marks, so we need to be a little bit more detailed here. So your introduction could be why sea levels are rising. We could talk about global warming, melting ice, thermal expansion, all of that kind of stuff. If you knew any, you could even chuck in some facts and figures about how much sea levels are rising. In the main body, we need to talk about, okay, so what? Why do we need to manage that? What's going to happen if we just let sea levels rise and we don't do anything about it? Well, you could talk about all the things that could change here, all of the things that could start to go underwater, all of the things that might start to get damaged by increasing wave heights, by storm surges, and all of those kinds of things. Okay, so it's global, but they do want you to refer to what could happen in figure one as well. B, nice and easy, state, it's kind of just what is it? State what is meant by isostatic change, two marks. Nice, straightforward thing. The only thing that happened with a few answers, can I just remind you that isostatic change can be up and down? Uh, a lot of you only talked about one direction of it. I'm not going to tell you why, because you can do some revision on that if needed. But isostatic change, it is up and down. Okay, the next questions are about these resources. So we get some graphs, we get a little map, and they are about two places. Uh, my pronunciation is probably not very good. Uh, Clypeda and Kaliningrad. Use figure two to examine. So that's kind of look at in detail. If you think about examining something under a microscope, you're kind of really looking at it in detail. Examine to what extent the coastal dynamics of Clypeda and Kaliningrad differ. How different are they? So we need to look at figure two, find some similarities, find some differences and make a decision about whether they are more similar to each other or more different to each other. Okay, so we've got quite a lot of commands there. Examine, which means detail, how similar or different they are. It's only five marks, so we're just gonna crack on with it. I'm not giving you any answers here, I'm just kind of pointing you in the right direction. They've given you graphs, use them. Get some figures, ladies and gents, okay? Get a ruler if necessary and actually come across to the y-axis and compare the percentage of eroding, compare the um, percentage of accreting so that you can actually uh, be really specific. We've got 95 and 2005, so if we're examining, which means to look at in detail, we need to look at any differences between those that 10-year period, okay? So it's what you're doing but focus on the command examine really look at in detail use those graphs get me some facts and figures and then make a decision are they more similar or are they more different it's all down to those command words ladies and gents really really followed up by a really nice easy question two marks suggest one reason that's your trip hazard one reason why rates of coastal erosion vary? That's a lovely question. You could talk about rock type, you could talk about wave energy, you could talk about all sorts of stuff, but just one, <laughs> okay? Describe two ways. So describe is say what. Two ways in which coastal sediment is transported. It's six marks, 
that's about three marks each. Now, if you wanted to give this a little bit of a structure, you could uh, talk about coastal processes. Uh, one of those sets of processes is transport. You've also got, of course, erosion, weathering, deposition, mass movement. Um, most people went for longshore drift and then one other. Diagrams would be absolutely brilliant in this question. I would highly recommend diagrams. And you just need to be as detailed as you can about how, what happens. How does longshore drift work? How does, I don't know, traction, saltation, whatever it is you went for, okay? Now, for your exam board, one of the things I really like about them, when we get to our longer answer questions, there's always a choice. Notice it says either or. Now, 15 mark questions. These are the ones where you've got to write a decent amount. So in the exam, you're gonna have about 15 to 20 minutes to write them. You need to be aiming for, you know, quite a, a good chunk of writing here. We need an introduction. So what you do is you find something in the question that you can define or give the background to. Here, you could maybe talk about what coastal depositional landforms are. You could kind of uh, introduce them or you could uh, talk about transport, which you've just done up here, so that would be nice and fresh in your brain. Here, you can talk about sea level change and why it happens. It doesn't matter, okay? It's just a way into the question where you're not repeating the question and you're showing off some knowledge. It's only one or two sentences. In the main body, and really we want to aim for like three good paragraphs in the main body that's where we want to answer the question so our command word here is evaluate evaluate is to weigh up how much how good how useful evaluate the importance of sediment transport in the development of one there's your trip hazard coastal depositional landfall now i'm going to go with spits for my little plan, because most of you chose spits. So your introduction could kind of describe what a spit is. Now, this is quite a popular question in case, and therefore I want to take a little bit of time to talk about it. Evaluate the importance of, dun, 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 in the development of one coastal landfall. What they want you to do is to realize that coastal processes are all part of the coastal system. They do not work on their own. Yes, of course, if you have a spit, longshore drift is kind of crucial in the creation of a spit. But you also need that sediment to have come from somewhere. You need it to have been eroded. You need some weathering. You need some deposition. You probably need a bit of mass movement. It isn't only transport that creates a spit. It's a combination of different processes together. Therefore, what you need to do in the main body is to go through all of those processes and talk about whether they are part of creating a spit or not, and in your opinion, how much of a part do they play? Would I include diagrams? Yes, I probably would, but that's just my personal choice. And then at the end, in our conclusion, what we have to do is we have to directly do this. We have to actually have an opinion on how important is transport in the development of a spit. And I'd say it's crucial, but it doesn't happen on its own. You also need the other coastal processes to go along with it, um, because that is the whole concept of a system. Everything is linked together. Okay, so evaluate the importance of questions. You've got to look at the bigger picture, all right? Not just the one process that they have picked on. Question four, um, we, U statically, which is the sea going up and down. Of course, sea levels are not falling. Sea levels are rising. The only way that you can get a fall in sea level in the world today is if the land is rising. Why does land rise? Well, either because of tectonic uplift or because it is still recovering from being squashed by ice in the last ice age. And the three places that we have talked about that are rising are Iceland, New Zealand and Scotland. 
Iceland and New Zealand, it's all linked with tectonics. Scotland, it's still recovering from the last ice age. So you need to pick one or all three if you want to. And you need to think about as the sea level goes down, because the land is rising, how has the coastal landscape changed? Well, you're going to get raised beaches. You're going to get relict cliffs. You're going to see all sorts of change. Um, again, diagrams would work quite nicely there. And then at the end, to what extent means you've got to have a decision. Has it completely changed the coastal landscape? Has it changed it a little bit? Has it not changed it at all? And I would probably go through the middle one of those three options. I'd say that a fall in sea level has, has changed the coastal landscape quite a lot. Um, but yeah, I don't, I mean, there is obviously stuff to say in that question, but um, personally, I'd have chosen question three. <laughs> right. I'm not going to spend very long on this set of questions because people did pretty well. Use figure one. So you have to use figure one. You can't freestyle. All right, that's your trip hazard in question 1A part one. Analyze look at in detail. We've already kind of said that it's kind of really similar to examine. You want to look at in detail. Analyze the economic impacts of high energy storm events. So you've got to find all the economic stuff you can here. Well, I can see damage to property. I can see damage to a train track. All of that's going to need repairing. Um, we've got Dawlish cutting off the southwest from the rest of the country. That's going to disrupt businesses, isn't it? And uh, deliveries and transport. Uh, Perrinporth has lost its beach, which will be a tourist attraction. We've got businesses flooded. There's loads of economic stuff going on in there. And they just want you to pick up on that and to talk about them a bit and talk about how this would cost money in all sorts of different ways. I think emphasising the fact that these are negative economic impacts would also be a really good idea. The next one's only two marks, but it, I do want to just talk about this a little bit. Suggest one social impact. So social is people. Economic is money. Social is people. Often the two are very much intertwined with each other, um, but here they've asked us to separate them. If we're talking about social impacts, then we want to talk about stress, trauma, loneliness, homelessness, those kinds of things. And what they were very clear about in the mark scheme for this question, I know it's only two marks, but it's worth knowing, it had to be realistic for this storm. This is Devon and Cornwall during the winter of 2013-14. Are people likely to have died? No, because we're a more developed country in recent times, people would have been warned about this, we would have evacuated people. Death is not a realistic social impact from these storms. It's possible, but it's unlikely. If you had a storm like this in a less developed country, death would have been realistic. Here, it's more to do with people having to evacuate these homes and being homeless and where are they going to live and being kind of traumatised by that and stressed out by the damage, that kind of thing. Now, part B, um, it's quite a tricky question, and it's where, to be honest, your Lyme Regis case study really helps you out. And we're going to be picking up on Lyme Regis after half term. What, well, there are two obvious positive impacts of coastal processes on human activity. One is the creation of beaches which are tourist attractions and the other very specific to Lyme is that mass movement and erosion gives you fossils. So you've got two choices there. Uh, the easier one is to talk about the creation of beaches which gives us places to go out for the day, it's good for our well-being, um, you can then have tourist businesses and you can make a real popular tourist resort so you can go off on the idea of, of beaches or fossils have an equal effect in Lyme Regis in that they draw lots and lots of people to go fossil hunting and stuff but we are going to pick up on questions like that when we do Lyme Regis. 
Right, a lovely, lovely maths question. <laughs> so, um, I have worked out the answers, you'll be pleased to know. It's a bit like Blue Peter. Here's one I did earlier, ladies and gents. I'm not going to work these out with you, I'm just going to tell you the answers and then you can see if you can get them. A is 4.84, B is 5.63, and C is 11.01. See if using the kind of prompts and stuff, you can get those answers. Give your answer to two decimal places. That is a trip hazard. If you don't read that, you could go wrong. Use figure three to interpret the result. Now you could carry an error here, because if you don't work out C correctly, things are gonna go a bit wrong for you, sorry. So 11.01, .01. what we have to do is we have to compare it with the critical values. 11.01 .01 is higher than 9.49, it is lower than 13.28. So we are 95% confident that um, the rates of coastal deposition are different in these five zones of southwestern India. And that's what they want you to say. We are not 99% sure of that because our result was not higher than 13.28. Right, part B. Suggest, command, two, trip hazard. So we've got roughly three marks each. Deposition, obviously, is sediment being put down. Why does the rate vary? Well, deposition is basically caused by... Uh, water slowing down and as it slows down it loses energy and it drops what it's carrying. So you could talk about energy but that's only one reason isn't it? Um, depth of water will have an effect. Personally, and I, you know that this is my favourite, I'd go for flocculation ladies and gents. <laughs> flocculation is a very specific type of deposition that happens in estuaries uh, but it does have a huge impact on the rate of deposition. So I talk about that one, but that's just me. Really nice one. Outline is key points only. Outline how coastal sediment is transported by traction. Two marks. Nice question. Right. Choice 15 markers. You getting the sense of this now? Examine. So look at in detail for both of them. The relative importance of geology. Now we've talked about this. So what they're saying here is, yes, okay, tell us about geology. But tell us about the other things that are important in one or more landforms of coastal erosion. So if you took, I don't know, wave cut notches, for example, yes, of course, geology is important, but so is wave energy. So is um, time of year and, and stuff like that. Anything where you've got relative importance, you need to mention the other things that are important as well as that one. And then at the end, you can make a decision about which one or which two or which three, whatever your opinion is, are the most important. I definitely would draw lots of diagrams um, in Coastal 15 markers. You don't have to, but you will get credit if you decide to. And personally, I think I would always talk about more than one landform just to make sure I could kind of show off my understanding properly, but um, that's your choice. This one, this is um, a case study led question. Examine the strengths and weaknesses of one strategy used to manage the impacts of human activity on coastal landscape systems. When we talk about Lyme Regis after half term, as I said, I will be picking up on questions like that, but that question is entirely case study led. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, use figure one to describe, just say what, the impact of the storm. We're playing spot the difference, aren't we, really? There's been a huge amount of erosion. The sand has all disappeared. The dunes have been eroded. It's hard to work out whether the sand has exposed larger sediment underneath which probably looks true, like these were probably the tops of these boulders, weren't they? So the sand has been eroded, leaving the larger sediment behind. 
They would have given you credit if you'd said the sand had been eroded and replaced by larger sediment. They would have been okay with that. It's had a very negative impact. The beach is much smaller than it used to be. That kind of stuff. Keep it simple. Everyone avoided this. <laughs> I don't think I saw one answer to this question. Examine. We're very familiar with that now. The role of fluvial processes. I bet that was your trip hazard. That means rivers, ladies and gents. Rivers. In the formation of one or more landforms in an estuarine environment. It's the phrasing I expect that scared you. Okay, this is flocculation. You could do mud flats, salt marshes. You could possibly talk about spits because spits are often found at the mouths of rivers. Um, what else could you talk about? Yeah, spits and salt marshes are probably your, your best bet. I, I think I would probably go for salt marshes. The, the idea that flocculation gives you mud flats, mud flats gradually give you the process of succession which over time will develop into a salt marsh. Okay. Use figure one, which didn't photocopy very well, but it didn't matter that it didn't because it's not massively useful. To outline why managed retreat is a positive choice for cum ivy, five marks. What you need to pick up on here um, is the positive stuff. Um, 39 acres of feeding and resting sites for birds and other wildlife, sustainable habitat, special wildlife value. You need to pick up on all the good stuff um, that they talk about in here and just mention it. Nice easy question really once you've got your head around it. Suggest one reason why the seawall has been breached. Now there are two sort of approaches to this. A lot of people thought that this had happened naturally um, and it was because of rising sea levels and storms and energy and you could get some credit for that, that's fine. I think it's much more likely that this is very much like Abbott's Hall Farm. I think the hole in the seawall has been done deliberately. Why was it done at Abbott's Hall Farm? Well, because they did a cost-benefit analysis and found out that the farmland, which you're told here, isn't worth protecting anymore. So they deliberately put five holes in the seawall at Abbots Hall Farm to allow the farm very gradually to return to salt marsh. I believe that's exactly what's happening here. So I think it's cost benefit analysis has said that the farmland is no longer worth protecting um, and they deliberately put a breach. But you've got marks for kind of either direction. Describe and explain how changes in sea level, so this could be eustatic or isostatic, in the formation of one coastal landform. Okay, you have a choice. Relict beach, sorry, relict cliff, raised beach, rear, field. You've got four to choose from there. It's completely up to you. I would say that the submergent landforms of rears and fields are a little bit easier. Um, Rears are river valleys that get filled up by the sea and fields are glacial valleys that get filled up by the sea. So you just need to pick one notice and uh, talk about how sea levels are changing and how they were created. Mathsy question. So you've got uh, the length of coastline in Wales. I'm just turning to the page ah, so I can have a look. Um, and then, yeah, you've got the length of coastlines eroded. It works out to be 23.1, ladies and gents, 23.1%. So I'm not giving you my workings, but you can see if you can get the right answer, <laughs> okay? Um, use figure two to describe the extent of coastline erosion in Wales. So you have to do that first compared to that in Scotland. Scotland, uh, so you can see that the length of coastline is much longer. You can see that the length of coastline eroding is much longer. But if I've already told you that the percentage for Wales is 23.1, then actually the percentage of eroding coastline is much worse in Wales than it is in Scotland. And you just need to compare those numbers in the sort of way that I have done. 
suggests one lithological factor that causes the rate of coastal erosion to vary. So that's kind of uh, mineral content, hardness of the rock. Um, so you can just pick one of those and talk about that. Uh, for example, you could talk about uh, the fact that some rocks are much easier to dissolve in the process of solution than others, for example. And part C, describe and explain why deposition plays a role. See, we're back at this. This is one of their favourites. They pick a landform, they pick a process, and they say, how important is this process in creating this landform? You have to mention the other processes as well. Tombolos, yes, they're depositional. Yes, they need deposition to happen, but you've got to have erosion and weathering and mass movement and transport before you get that deposition. See, it's one of their favourites and they just keep coming back to it in lots of different ways. Right, we're nearly there. Um, so you have to look at this on screen because it didn't photocopy in the module at all well. You get a satellite image. So we can see uh, a spit. We can see loads of sediment in the system. We can see some dunes here. We've got a river estuary. Uh, you can see loads of deposition and mud flats forming and all of that stuff. Right, use figure one, so we've got to use this, to suggest, getting very familiar with that, how this part of the coast operates as a system. Okay, let's remind ourselves about systems. They have inputs, outputs, stores and processes. And if you change one part of the system, you will have knock-on effects. So you've got to just keep in mind what a system is. So we know that rivers bring on average about um, 80 to 90 percent of the sediment to the coastal system. Estuaries are crucial for our sediment. So we've got loads of sediment coming. Look, huge amounts of sediment and then that sediment gets moved. You can see it's become an offshore bar but that supply of sand will also be where the dunes have come from. It will also have something to do with the, the longshore drift that has created this spit will have to do with the longshore drift then that creates this beach along here. So you just need to talk using systems language like inputs, outputs, stores and processes that all of these are kind of interrelated and the sediment just moves around from one place to the other. Assess the positive and negative impacts of coastal processes on human activity. I like this question, I think this is lovely. Um, we coastal processes give us beaches which we've talked about but they also cause huge amounts of erosion we have storm surges which kill people and cause lots of damage but then they provide us fossils which people like and they are important for understanding evolution and tourism and all of those kinds of things I would pick a couple of positives and a couple of negatives um, and yeah, talk about how they affect people in relation, if at all possible, to uh, case studies or named places. Because remember in 15 markers, if we can get our case studies in, we are going to have a much better crack of it. Um, so in your introduction, you could maybe talk about coastal processes. That might be a nice way in. In the main body, you're just going to get onto those positive and negative impacts. In your conclusion, look, we need to assess. We need to make a decision. Are they equal? Are the positives and negatives equal? Do the positives outweigh the negatives? Does it depend on who you are? I don't know, any opinion you want. As long as you come to an assessment at the end, you will be fine. Right, and finally, these come from a revision guide and it is okay to photocopy 5%, so I'm not breaking too many rules here. Use figure two, which I'm afraid hasn't copied brilliantly, but it's better in your module booklet. Use figure two to describe the possible factors that may have influenced the decision to build sea defences in this area. Well, what you begin to find out is that you've got towns and villages and golf courses and car parks, and if you always come back to the idea of cost-benefit analysis. If there is something worth protecting, 
generally management will happen. So that's the, the key idea that they're trying to get you to talk about there. Suggest why the sea defences in figure one may impact on the coast further down at her spit. Well, the coast is a system. Whatever you do will have knock-on effects. Sea defences generally will reduce the amount of erosion. That's kind of their point. And if you build groins, which we can see here, the whole point of a groin is to stop longshore drift. We are going to have much less sediment making its way to her spit, which might mean that the spit starts to be eroded and get smaller and cause problems. And that's why an understanding of the coast as a system is so crucial to the idea of coastal management. What you do in one part of the coast could well affect everybody else quite badly. Outline what is meant by the term manage retreat. That's one of our four management options where you sort of admit that the sea is going to win <laughs> and you allow it to erode and flood the land, but in a managed way. Table one, we've got some coastal erosion rates and they want you to compare the numbers uh, between A and B. Um, that's look for similarities, look for differences. Um, you could do some subtracting maybe to work out the difference between the two, maybe. That might be quite interesting. Is it increasing from 1975 to 1980 to 2010, 2015? Is it decreasing in speed? Just use the numbers as much as you can. Outline, key ideas only, one trip hazard way in which sub-aerial processes, you have a choice there between weathering and mass movement. Outline one way in which sub-aerial processes influence the shape of a cliff. So you just need to pick whatever one you want to talk about. Um, so I can't really answer that because it depends on <laughs> what you decide to go for. And finally, suggest how future changes in sea levels. We know that globally sea levels are rising because of ice melt and thermal expansion. We call it eustatic sea level change. How it might influence rates of coastal erosion at the location shown in table one. The idea being that as sea levels rise, we are likely to see an increase in rates of coastal erosion because the water will be deeper. And if you go way, 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 way back to the beginning of coast, when we were talking about waves, there are four factors that affect the size of a wave. And one of them is depth of water. So if our sea levels are rising, our water will get deeper, our waves will get more powerful, which will mean more erosion. Whew, that was a marathon, wasn't it? Well done, folks.